Man has no understanding. He can be taught a few simple tricks, nothing more. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is a very unique video, I think, so far, certainly on my channel, where I'm going to do a video on philosophy. So, I have a deep interest in philosophy. I did a course on philosophy, and I really want to touch on a lot of things I covered in the course. And, and as such, I'm going to break it down into four sections, three philosophical sections that relate to the three parts kind of units, if you like, of the course I did. Then the fourth section is going to be like an outside look on philosophy and how you can look at other things philosophically. So in the video, I will be taking these different themes, these three different approaches to philosophy and talking about particular philosophers and talking about um, their take on existence and thought and ethics and political theory and give it some context and um, in some sometimes I'll relate it to other philosophers as well and I'll talk about some specific books but it should give you a just a general overview of modern philosophy so I don't touch too much on the um, ancient Greeks and ancient Rome uh, philosophy because I've, I've, I'm considering doing a separate one on that but I am going to start with Plato. So we are going to talk about Plato, but I do switch on to modern philosophy quite quickly. And a lot of this is about that. So hopefully, if, the, if you're completely new to philosophy, you might find this interesting. If you already have a background or knowledge of philosophy, then you'll probably recognise a lot of this stuff. And um, I'd be interested to know what your favourite elements of philosophy are. There are some people I've left out, some modern philosophers I've left out which I'm going to talk about at the end. But this is like a general overview of some of the things that kind of inspired me when I did the philosophy course. So some things I really liked, uh, and we'll see how we get on. So I'm going to start by talking about Plato. So Plato lived between 427 BC and 348 BC. So um, a hugely important figure in philosophy, a hugely important figure in ancient Greece, and uh, as was Sophocles and Aristotle. But um, I'm just going to talk about Plato for a minute for one specific reason, and that is um, Plato's theory of the cave. So I'm going to use the Plato's theory of the cave to start talking about epistemology. I'll talk about what epistemology means in a minute, but I just want to talk about Plato's theory of the cave. So... His theory of the cave is in the book The Republic, which I would definitely recommend that you read. If you, um, I mean, I'm going to recommend lots of uh, modern philosophical books, but I definitely recommend The Republic by Plato. It's a really, really important book and really interesting. And the theory of the cave is essentially really quickly i mean it's a lot more detailed than this but essentially really quickly the idea that um plato describes these figures that are these people that are chained to the wall in a cave and they're captives and their sense of reality is completely confined to what they can sense and what they can hear and what they can see on the shadows of the walls and what they hear around them and they're they become accustomed to this, so they they see what what they are seeing on the shadows of the walls. Essentially, like importantly, this is what he's kind of stressing as their reality. And what Plato is saying is that actual reality is a lot more than that. It's a lot more than what these captives can see against the wall. And what he's theorizing is life is like that, and that what we see as as important and subjective is not actually reality and we could be being fooled by our own senses and our own uh, uh, our own sense of reality so that is a hugely important uh, statement to make and a brilliant statement to make 
and essentially, uh, if you, if you look at the mo- there's a modern equivalent of that, and it, that's the Matrix. So if you think about the Matrix, the Matrix is definitely using the theory of the cave in a science fiction setting, in that idea that our reality is a lot more than what we think it is because you know according to the Matrix film, um, there are these aliens that are controlling the Earth and all that sort of stuff. So human knowledge human beliefs humans own a sense of their own uh, position in their own reality and reality as a home their own universe is utterly subjective according to plato's theory of the cave and that's a really interesting starting point to think about epistemology so epistemology is the theory of knowledge so the theory of knowledge is literally how we think how we know how we apply our thought, how real is it, how do we create morals from it, um, how do we know that we exist, and what is real. That's kind of, is it, yeah, that's where the, the theory of knowledge, the theory of thought sort of gets sort of applied, I guess. But epistemology is kind of a really interesting way to start. I'll just tell you now that the three areas we're going to, um, break these things down to is uh, epistemology, theory of knowledge, then um, political thought, and then ethics. Yeah, they kind of they they kind of uh, uh, morph into each other a little bit. So, epistemology. Uh, we have to talk about Descartes. Descartes is a French philosopher. He lived between fifteen ninety six. And 1650, 1596 and 1650. So this, this he's kind of seen as one of the forefathers of modern philosophy, and it's really interesting looking at the way he developed his theories. And and I thought it was I when I studied it, I thought it was really fascinating, and I was a bit gutted that because of the time he lived and his own particular subjective connection to spirituality and ultimately theism, uh, he doesn't quite go as far as he could have done with this theory. So, so what he tried to do was try to reduce uh, knowledge to its bare minimum to think about what do we know for sure is real. So going back to that idea of the theory of the cave, if we are potentially being fooled by what we can see around us, and fooled by our senses, Descartes, in the 16th century, is thinking, well, 17th century, really, he's thinking, what can we do in our rationale um, to be absolutely sure that what we are saying and thinking is real? Uh, so that's, that's his basis of his theories. And he was all about the rationale. He was all about rationality. So Descartes was was always arguing that rationality was the basis of great thought and and basis of our existence and about great human behavior rationality rationale reasoning yeah so this is like the age of reason you know uh, so really important what Descartes trying to get at with the importance of rationality and reason if you put that in the context of centuries and centuries of society that's been dominated by religion, belief, um, a a leap of faith, faith being uh, the the public being uh, um, subjects to their rulers. Um, The age of reasoning does bring about a very different kind of world and a very different thinking. That's why philosophy is so important, because it can create a new way of approaching the world and therefore a new way of approaching authority and a new way of approaching uh, the, the meaning of life and the point of life, if you like. So basically what he... He, can't, he tried to think about, well, what, what can he know for sure is real? He can't really be sure that when he sees something in the room that that's really there because it could be his eyes tricking him. It could be in an optical illusion, so it could look like a chair, for example, but it's actually something else that makes it look like a chair. 
or it's a two-dimensional image of a chair that, that's positioned in a particular way that makes it look three-dimensional. There's all sorts of ways that our senses trick us, so therefore we can't trust our senses. This is what Descartes suggesting. And anyway, that kind of reasoning gets boiled down to the idea of thought is the one thing that makes us human and makes us absolutely aware of our own existence. So that's where he came up with the very famous phrase, which you may know of, but I don't know if you if you would know that it's associated with Descartes, and that is, I think, therefore I am. If you get a chance to look into the way that Descartes gets to that point where the only thing he's absolutely certain of is, is thought, and that's what makes humans real, and that's what makes reality real. Everything else he doubts, but he has absolute um, trust in thought, which is why he's come up with the I think, therefore I am. Then check out Descartes' book. So I've got a couple of examples here. So there's the Routledge are brilliant at doing philosophical books. There's a few Routledge books here. They are really good. So this is um, a book that, uh, really explains the I think therefore I am uh, theory, the um, ego cogito, and um, there's a nice one here that I found which is like philosophical writing, so different kind of writings by um, uh, Descartes, and this is from the Open University Press. So, um, but it's got it's got you know the, the essential writings for. Um, like the science of uh, principles of material things. This is all about rationality and the importance of um, uh, truth and understanding what's true and what's false. Um, that's that's where a lot of his sort of theories came from. So that's Descartes, really really important philosopher that kind of brought in this new age of reasoning. So in response to that. Um, is a Scottish philosopher called David Hume. I really like David Hume. He's a really interesting guy. This is a big old book um, of David Hume's writings, uh, The Essential Philosophical Works. It's a really good book from Wordsworth, I think it is. Yeah. Um, but if you get a chance to get any books by David Hume, it's worthwhile. The, main, the really famous things he wrote, so there's the a Treatise on Human Nature, uh, which it came out in 1739, and then there's the uh, an inquiry concerning human understanding, which came out in 1751. So this is um, so that was in three parts, and that th those four those those three parts and that other first book pretty much um, pans out his theories that are kind of a response to that Descartes, and what Hume thought was that um, that. What, what Descartes argued wasn't really how humans thought, that rationality and thought was not, and reasoning was not as important as feelings. So we were completely governed by our feelings. So all of our decisions we made in our lives, so our decisions for what career we took, our relationships, you know, our long-term relationships, our, our ideas about parenting, our ideas about uh, what we would gravitate towards for entertainment um, and how we'd fill our day. Everything, according to David Hume, was completely dominated by feelings and not rational thought. So he believed that rational thought did play a part, but only a smaller part than the larger part that was played by our feelings and our emotions. So we were absolutely emotive in the way that we conducted our lives and therefore... Reasoning and rationale can only go so far, and what he was trying to do was to argue that uh, we were uh, much more driven by our feelings, and we were much more animalistic. That's what he's suggesting, that we were essentially animals. So Descartes argued that we were above animals, that we were on a different plane, and there was, there was a much more sophisticated brain at work. And Hume argued that... Um, we were driven by our feelings because we were essentially animals. So, a very different approach, um, but very important uh, 
progression, difference, uh, argument, antithesis on Descartes' argument about rationality. And really interesting guy, David David Hume. So he didn't. Not everything he said is great. So I mean, one of the things that you know, the more you look at these things, I mean, I'm I'm kind of like looking at the most important kind of um, uh, turning points, if you like. And some of what David Hume said is a bit out of date, but I think that's going to be true anyway, isn't it? Because we're looking at um, old values. And those two things are kind of the two kind of opposite ends, if you like, of what I was looking at in epistemology. So if we then now go on to um, political philosophy, then I'm going to start with um, Hobbes. I'm going to start with Hobbes first. So Hobbes was born in 1588 and... He died in 1679. So he died. So he lived a long life, and in this life, um, he made a huge difference in political philosophy. He was an English philosopher, and if you think about when he lived, so 1588 to 1679, you, we're talking about most of the 17th century, and he's English, and this means that the 17th century in England was quite dramatic, uh, because that's obviously when we had our civil war. And it's when we cut the king's head off, and you know it was it was absolute chaos for a good uh, twenty years up, leading up to sixteen forty nine. Um, there was there was all sorts of radical ideas being branded about. There was there was loads of different factions. There was the 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 parliament was in loads of different. Um, it was in disarray basically. The it was it was united to. to um, uh, fought against the king i mean the, the king had had its supporters as well but there was there was definitely different levels of radicalism happening in the civil war this makes i think the english civil war is so fascinating from that perspective but he was seeing all this and he and he was scared by what was happening with this dissent and this um cynical attitude to government and he wrote leviathan and Leviathan is a really important work, political work. I don't agree with Leviathan. I think it's really important to read it, but I don't agree with it. But it's such an important development in uh, conservatism, basically. And what he was doing, because he was worried about what was happening in the 17th century in England, he came up with this theory that was, again, relating to what David Hume was saying about us being animals, but in a more savage way. So what he was suggesting was he was going back to um, the um, the start of civilization when we were tribal, and there was uh, you know it, it was it was like sort of um, before civilization started, and rulers came out of a need for some kind of order and some kind of authority. And what he was arguing was it was really important for people to acknowledge that and obey their leaders, obey their rulers. And he was suggesting that there was a social contract. We'll get on to the social contract in a second. There was a social contract, but that social contract had to be reconciled with the uh, really important place that rulers and authority had over the public. And that if the public always... Um, argued against the rulers and always um, uh, made some kind of judgment on what was happening with them, then that would cause anarchy in his idea. So, so he had this idea, this sort of pyramid idea of society, and he thought it was really important to maintain that pyramid. And he thought that uh, it was just, you know, order, and because he basically argued that hu uh, human nature was inherently violent and inherently competitive. Uh, so, so those things resulted in his political theory, um, which was all put out in Leviathan. So a really interesting book and really interesting theory, not one I agree with, but something that uh, is really important to read, I think, to see the context of that. And then you can have a look at his um, a response to that, which would be Rousseau. Rousseau... It's probably my, well, it's definitely one of my favourite philosophers 
He was born in 1712 and died in 1778. And he was from Geneva. So Geneva was a republic. It's now part of Switzerland, obviously. It's the second biggest city in Switzerland. But Geneva was um, a very important um, place in Europe. And Rousseau uh, was from Geneva. And he wrote, Jack Rousseau wrote the social contract. And the social contract is a great response to Hobbes' Leviathan. Rousseau's argument was that humans were social creatures and the only way society works productively is with an acknowledgement of the social contract and the idea that rulers are working for the people um, and the people are working for the rulers. So there's like an agreement, the social contract, that these things are working in harmony. And if disharmony happens, so there's some kind of issue with um, someone not pulling their weight, so the rulers are not pulling their weight even, or the, or the public not pulling their weight, then obviously that's where you get unrest, you get dissent, or you get issues with authority clamping down, and that kind of stuff. So the social contract is where both um, parties have to uh, work together um, because... According to Rousseau, we are social creatures and we need to work together for it to for us to survive properly and to flourish and to advance society. And this book had a huge effect on the French Revolution. The French Revolution was 1789 to 1799, and for those 10 years, um, the, the, the France was uh, undergoing a huge political change that was influenced by this essential idea that the government should be questioned and should be brought to account if um, they are failing the people. And obviously that, that becomes really uh, prevalent later as well for, with, with other um, instances of unrest or revolutions as well later. But because the French Revolution had a huge effect as well itself. But Rousseau's book, The Central Social Contract, is really, really important. It's not that long as well. So uh, if, you're, if you want to dip your toe into... Um, philosophy and you're a little bit intimidated by a big book like that for Leviathan then you could read a smaller book like that and this is this is better than that anyway <laughs> um, but very important to see both sides and see how these things develop so Rousseau social contract um, they're um, really important part of 18th century philosophy the portable enlightenment reader is a really really good uh, overview of different philosophies that were happening during the enlightenment and some of these things are covered that I've already mentioned. But there's also Thomas Paine is talked about. He gets um, a section. And um, Benjamin Franklin is talked about in here, the American um, De Declaration of Independence. Uh, John Locke has got a big section here as well. So I haven't mentioned John Locke, but he's really important as well um, as another part of, of the development of polit political philosophy. So certainly worth looking at John Locke as well uh, for, the, for the big picture. But yeah, if you uh, want to have a look at one of the overview books, then uh, the Portable Enlightenment Reader is really good. But moving forward, you get somebody like Hegel. So I haven't got a book to show you for Hegel. But Hegel is a really important German philosopher who um, talked about how humanity has always been driven by conflict and by argument and by... And, and, like, and development only happens through conflict. So... He came up with this idea that there was a, a thesis and then a, an antithesis, and then those two things clashing produced a synthesis. So that was his idea. And Hegel's ideas produced Karl Marx's ideas about uh, how the uh, people, the, the underclass, if you like, um, have always, throughout history, have always been uh, struggling to improve their lot, to change society, and this conflict has been absolutely constant throughout history, um, that this is a Marxist uh, approach to history. Marx's ideas were absolutely influenced by Hegel, uh, but Marx obviously approached the Hegelian theory on human development into a political statement about how 
the working class, because at this point the Industrial Revolution happened and there was such a thing as a working class, how the working class could improve their situation and rise up and create a new society, which, which was his Communist Manifesto, which he wrote with Frederick Engels, um, which, again, hugely influential. So I've got tons of Marxist books, but I haven't actually got that much written by Marx. So I've got the Communist Manifesto. I haven't, I don't own a version of Das Kapital. I find it quite hard to, it's quite dry to read Karl Marx himself. Um, but obviously, uh, one of the most quoted and influential philosophers in general, and a hugely important man, uh, he clearly had a huge influence on the Russian Revolution, well, the Russian revolutions, um, but he also had an influence on all sorts of things. So he was born in 1818, and he died in 1883, a uh, German philosopher, um, hugely, hugely important. Marx brings out this sort of dichotomy, if you like, these people that believe, they're kind of bouncing off Rousseau, I think. So this sort of idea that the state has a responsibility to... Uh, work for the people, if you like. So, so you know, th th it, Marx's ideas produce all sorts of things, but that's definitely one of the things that, that Marx produces. So that's that. Oh, and just to kind of clarify what's going on there, I was just talking, I was just showing you this, which is a dictionary of Marx's thought, which I think is a really, really good book. It's um, it's a quite nice thick tone. It's a good. This is from Blackwell's, and there are obviously lots of different social commentators that have a Marxist approach. And you can buy books by Trotsky and, you know, you can buy um, books by uh, Rosa Luxemburg and um, all sorts of different um, modern Marxists as well. And there's, there's lots of history books that are, that are written from a Marxist perspective and lots of feminists that are, that are Marxist feminists. He's, he's had such a huge influence on modern thought and modern political thought that, you know, Marxists are everywhere. Uh, so uh, I picked a book, even though I've got a lot of books by Marxists, I've picked that dictionary because it's quite a nice overview of Marxist thought. So I wanted to talk about um, this really awesome overview. So Bertrand Russell wrote uh, A History of Western Philosophy. And again, it's a really good Routledge book. So Routledge, um, where are we? Uh... Yeah, I mean, that's that's the symbol for the Routledge books. If you want to kind of, again, dip your toe in, you want a general idea, Rus uh, Bertrand Russell's History of Western Phil uh, Philosophy is really good, and, it, and it's got a lot of um, detail that sort of break it down into different areas. And uh, it's just really, really good. Definitely recommend this one. And Bertrand Russell's written some really interesting books. I, th I think he's a really interesting man. And there's lots of... Um, Routledge released a lot of small books he wrote as well. So this is obviously a big book that is history of philosophy. But he wrote things like uh, What I Believe, which is a very small book. Uh, there's also one called Nuclear Warfare and Common Sense. And there's also another book he wrote called Why I'm Not a Christian. These are really small Routledge books that, that they, they released. So definitely recommend these as well. They're great. But if you want one where he just talks about other philosophers, then... Um, this history of Western philosoph philosophy is really good. Okay, so having said that, let's talk about e um, ethics for a minute. And in particular, I mean, I'll quick mention Aristotle's ethics book. I wasn't going to talk about ancient philosophy, uh, but this book is really good. And it's a really good insight into how developed and interesting and nuanced ancient Greek philosophy was. Uh, and the um, ethical ideas of people like Aristotle. So this is definitely recommended. Um, it's a really interesting book. And Greek thought was all about... Um, it was quite um, uh, egalitarian in its approach about how government should be working with the people and there was a lot of freedom in, in, in Greek thought. And ethics was the, the ethics of Aristotle definitely reflects that idea of, of what's kind of sensible and kind of common sense. So, so yeah, I definitely recommend that. But I wanted to talk about John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism, because utilitarianism is really interesting. Um, 
So, um, oh, what's going to, where was, where was I going to talk about that? Uh, where am I? No, it's all right. <laughs> um, so, John Stuart Mill uh, was not the only person to come up with utilitarianism. So there was another guy, and I don't have a book by him at the minute, called Jeremy Bentham. And um, Jeremy Bentham was born in 1748. So this is still the 18th century, and he, was, he died in 1832. And John Stuart Mill was born in 1806 and died in 1873. So in this period, crossover period, they both were working towards this really important theory which is utilitarianism. It's a really interesting idea about um, ethics. And up to the point when they came up with utilitarianism, a lot of ideas about how humans should behave was all based around the way we think and the way we feel and uh, what's right for us. So um, it was like um, what, what we think would make us happy or what we think is right for society, and it was all you know. It was all um, quite immediate. And John Stuart Mill and Jer Jeremy Benford came. Jeremy Bentham came up with this idea that um, it is important to think about how to produce happiness, but more importantly, and this is the uh, the theory of utility. What's really important is what is hap what creates happiness for the most amount of people. So, a really easy way of explaining this is to just refer to Spock <laughs> and refer to uh, the Star Trek idea of um, it's what it's not what uh, is is the was it the needs of the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, right? Um, ultimately, that is utilitarianism. So the idea that um, it's not just what makes you happy, but what makes the most amount of people happy. So it's a really interesting idea because once you get that, then you start discussing it. And if certainly if you if you if you study this kind of thing in a class set classroom setting, and you're in a discussion, you could get tied up in knots about well, what does that really mean? What is best for society? And does it become subjective? How do you know? Because the problem with utilitarianism is that it's a theory based around consequences. And obviously, consequences are only really known through hindsight. So you don't really know what the consequences of your decision is, which is where the difficulty comes with utilitarianism. But it's a fantastic theory, and it is very important, because it is quite... Um, it is kind of like common sense, the idea that, that the uh, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. But the difficulty comes trying to figure out what, what that really means as far as how you're going to make your decisions. And do you know that what you're saying is better for everybody or not? You know, you, these consequences could be uh, things you're not expecting. So John Stuart Mill, I've got here the subject, subjection of women, which is um, quite a forward thinking um, book where he starts talking about the way women are treated. And this is a really good uh, general book, a, a collection of critical essays um, that um, I found secondhand recently, which is really cool. Um, and uh, it's got loads of his ideas in here. Um, so this is these are edited um, essays of his, of John Stuart Mill himself. Um, so, uh, but Jeremy Bentham's um, uh, books on utilitarianism are really important as well. So definitely recommend them, those. So, that's kind of what I wanted to cover on the actual philosophers themselves. But there's a few other things I want to talk about with these with modern uh, philosophy. So there's a really good book that uh, was co-edited by a friend of mine. Uh, Jonathan Pierce is a friend of mine. Um, but he's written quite a lot of philosophical books. And 13 Reasons to Doubt is a really good book. Um, and you can see the contributions here. Um, and it's, it's really good. Um, so I'll just go over the, um, you've got to start there, the introduction, there's um, A Brief History of Doubt, The Great Skeptics from Antiquity to Renaissance, um, and you've got people talking about different philosophers 
and their take on different things. It's like a book about scepticism. Um, Hume was a skeptic, which is why they do quote Hume. Um, but um, skepticism is a is a big field of of, of uh, philosophical thought in itself. <laughs> why you can't trust your brain. That reminds us of Plato's theory of the cave, right? Um, so that's a really interesting book. Also, A.C. Grayling, his stuff is really interesting to look at. So he's, he's written a few different books that are really worth looking at. The Meaning of Things is one that I've got. I did used to have another one. I think it's called The Nature of Things. I'm not sure. But uh, Grayling's a really interesting guy to look at. So he's a modern philosopher. And again, he draws from some of the people that have come before him. But Grayling's really good. Um, and I've talked about this book before. But this is a really nice um, way into philosophy because this is a um, hundred thought experiments um, edited by Julian Beghini. And the idea is that it leads you into different philosophers that have tackled these kind of things. The pig that wants to be eaten. And it just makes you think. And uh, it's really good. So an example of the kind of thing you'd find in this book is the idea that, say, if you've, heard, you've probably had this conversation yourself where there's like uh, you're on a boat and you've got so many much rations and you think you're going to be on that boat for two days before you see land and there's someone that um, is adrift and needs to go on the boat, do you let him on knowing that your rations are going to be fewer or do you let him die? That kind of thing. So you've got these ethical questions in here and some philosophical questions about um, the, the sort of uh, nature of, of human existence. So that's worth checking out as well. I love that book. I'm just going to talk about how philosophy can feature in lots of different things. So um, playwrights um, have got a very philosophical um, attitude to what they write quite often. And uh, I was going to talk about two in particular, two of my favourite playwrights that have definitely got a very philosophical approach to their work. And that's Bertolt Brecht. And The Good Person Satchuan is a really good book about how someone who is innately good is trying to do good for the people around them and eventually has to become a bad person to continue being good. Brecht is very clever at, at, at looking at the nuance of morality and, uh, and turning that into a political statement. And The Good Person Such One is an amazing play from that point of view because of that. Uh, Harold Pinter uh, is a phenomenal playwright. He's my favourite playwright. But his take on humanity and the way our relationships work and the way that our brains work is quite savage in a way, quite animalistic. Um, and you could uh, argue it's, it's a little bit negative because in Pinter's work you get this underlying threat of unspoken violence that could come out at any point, like a, you know, like a rage that's inside us. And... And you see that sort of boiling up in his plays. And uh, a fascinating playwright, but definitely he's got this sort of particular philosophical take on human nature and our relationships. Um, you could also uh, argue that looking into the way that we are, the way our brains work, the way humanity works, can lead into our thoughts about the way we treat animals. And that requires a lot of knowledge about what, animals are like and how deep are their, are their thoughts and I would definitely recommend this book Reaching Into Thought The Minds of the Great Apes if you wanted to know more about the way that the great apes think and it would if you don't know much about this sort of thing and you did read this book it would really give you a new perspective on their rights or how they probably deserve a lot more rights than they get and the way we treat animals in general but the, certainly the way we treat the great apes so there's that and then I'm just going to just quickly talk about um, how science fiction tackles philosophy quite a lot. And there's a great anthology here of dystopian novels. So if you look at political philosophy and how that can lead to great thoughts of dystopia, this is a great anthology of uh, dystopian stories here, Brave New Worlds. And then you've got someone like Ted Chiang, who uses um, his fiction to discuss how technology affects society and has a very philosophical take on his writing and what he wants to say about what human nature is, what 
love is, what human existence and the meaning of life is, and wrapped around kind of the what if questions that technology brings us. So there we are. So some thoughts there on some philosophy, some of the modern philosophers, and um, some some other areas you can find philosophy. I haven't mentioned Sophocles. I haven't mentioned Immanuel Kant. I haven't mentioned Frederick Nietzsche. I haven't mentioned Wittgenstein. And a modern philosopher that talks a lot about animal rights, Peter Singer, I haven't mentioned him either. But um, I just thought this was a nice kind of um, general overview of some of the books I have and some of my experience in the course that I studied. Hope you enjoyed that. Sorry this is a bit long. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye. Like to be